invite you to take your Bibles out and open them up to the Gospel according to John. John chapter 5. Sometimes it's important to know the difference between temporary and permanent. So temporary, as you know, refers to something that can be changed. Permanent, on the other hand, refers to something that cannot be changed. And this is important, actually, for understanding the subject that we come to this morning. God's judgment. And the central point is that God's judgment will establish a permanent distinction between people. Some people are going to enter into the fullness of life. And some people are going to enter into what the Bible calls death. Or condemnation and the Bible speaks of the day of God's judgment in many many places and Jesus addresses it specifically in our passage this morning in fact this is probably the first the earliest time in his ministry that he spoke about this John chapter 5 verse 28 where Jesus says do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and he means his own voice, and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, Jesus' comments here present three doctrines. First, death is not the end of our existence. Second, there are two forms of existence beyond the grave one good and one terrible. And then, third, the particular kind of existence depends upon a person's relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the obvious conclusion here is that people should examine themselves right now in regards to that relationship with Christ. So let's just begin in depth with Jesus' first point. Physical death is not the end of existence. Not the end of existence. Another way of saying it, the grave is not the end for anyone. Now I think most people believe that in theory, but not so much in practice. In fact, I think most people are what we call practical atheists. A practical atheist. What's that? A practical atheist says they believe in God, but then really they live their life as if this world is all there is. No concern beyond the grave. No advanced planning for God's judgment. And they wouldn't say they're an atheist, but they live like they're an atheist for all practical purposes. And so what a shock then that death is going to be for most people, because they're going to die. Have you heard the latest statistics, by the way? I read last week, 10 out of 10 people die. Wow, isn't that amazing? People are dying every day. And when they do, they are immediately shocked that their existence goes on beyond the grave. And have you also noticed that we don't get to pick and choose the day we die or even the manner of our death? Sure, you've heard the news. Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger on a prop gun last week that was actually loaded with real ammunition. He shot and killed a woman who was a director on that movie set. Now think about that. I'm sure the last thing that that woman imagined happening to her that day when she woke up to go to work that morning is that she would die. But she did die, tragically. Two teenage girls from Berry Hill had a wreck just a couple of nights ago. One of them died tragically and so these two human beings they know personally right now that death is not the end of existence and that teaching by the way that's not new with Jesus it's not like that's the first time the world had ever heard that in fact Jesus is absolutely one and in line with what the Old Testament taught about physical death not being the end of existence. So we can go all the way back into early Genesis with what we call the patriarchs, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and those guys. And when their deaths are described in the Old Testament, life beyond the grave is just assumed. Each of those men is described as being gathered in death to those people who lived before them. So we read of Abraham, for instance, in Genesis 25. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. An old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. We are told in Genesis 35, Isaac, that's Abraham's son, he breathed his last and he died and was gathered to his people. Jacob, 
had the same expectation when he was told of the apparent death of his son Joseph. Remember, Joseph wasn't dead. His brothers had said he'd been killed, but they sold him into slavery. And we read in Genesis 37 of Jacob, he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. I'm just simply showing that the Old Testament presents life beyond the grave. Now the mention of Sheol right there, that's interesting because that introdu introduces us to just another indication that the Old Testament taught that there's life beyond the grave. So Sheol, <clears throat> I don't know what English version of the Bible, I remind you the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, so every Bible you have, I don't care if it's King James Version, New English Translation, e English Standard Version, New International Version, all these versions and perversions as some people say, um, all of them are an attempt to translate out of the original. So you might have one that translates that word Sheol as hell or death or grave. And I just wanted to tell you uh, that's wrong. That is a horrendous translation. So you can just draw a line through that and just know that was wrong. Sheol was simply the ancient people's name for the place where dead people went. And that's, that's righteous people, unrighteous people, good people, sinful people, you know, wonderful people, evil. That's just the place that, that dead people went. And what that means is, is right there in Genesis, at that point in ancient human history, God had not yet fully revealed that there's going to be this thing called Judgment Day and eternal life in one of two different places. That came in the New Testament. So the Old Testament, though, just clearly teaches, though, that there's this place called Sheol. We don't know much about it. But life goes on past the grave. That's the point. Ancient people knew there's life to come. They knew that. Now, how about you? How about you? Because the, the statistic still stands, 10 out of 10 people die. We've never managed to get away from that. I, as a minister, have stood in graveyards so many times at funerals. And I look around, and I've shared this, but I look around every time I'm there. I invite those who are gathered with me there around their loved one's grave and just to look around them at, at the hundreds and, and even thousands of gravestones. And engraved in every stone are the pertinent details of that person's life. And what are those pertinent details? The day they were born and the day that they died, right? And, and I would just guess that I have stood over the graves of rich and poor, very successful human beings, and just kind of irrelevant, just folks. What's the common denominator? Death came for them all. Some of those people, you know, in any particular cemetery, some of those people, I mean, they were the movers and shakers of the world. They were the go-getters. They were blessed by God with more gifts and skills than I could even dream of. And I mean, they took life by the horns and they put their mark on the world, right? However, isn't it interesting that most of those marks, that those successful people put on the world, what are happening to those marks now? They're just kind of fading into the annals of history. We don't even know their names, most of them. Just the things that they thought were so wonderful. But I'll tell you this much, they, whoever they are, they are still alive. Their spirit, their soul, everything that makes them them, they, they, are, they exist because physical death is not the end of existence. And I just tell you, you are going to die, and so am I, because we are sinners. That's why we die, that's where death came from. And yet death is not the end of your existence. And what are you going to do with that fact? What are you doing with it? In fact, when you wake up tomorrow morning to face your week, whatever Monday brings for you, what thoughts are going to depress most upon your mind tomorrow? Maybe it's a deadline that your boss already gave you, and you just kind of know, oh, I don't, want, I don't even want to go to work next week because i got to do that. Maybe it's some difficult assignment at school. You've been putting it off, but I mean, the, we're coming close to the end of the semester, and you're like, i got that paper to write, i got that big test. Or maybe it's just something you're looking forward to. That's what you're, you can't wait for next week. Or maybe it's something you're dreading. Or maybe it's a medical issue. Well, I can sure, assure you that whatever is pressing on you tomorrow morning, it will fade into meaninglessness in time. What will not fade, though, what refuses to go away, is that you will die. And you will hear the voice of Jesus someday calling you to judgment, calling you to judgment. That won't go away. And that brings us to the second doctrine that Jesus taught in this passage. There are two forms of existence beyond the grave, one good and one terrible. And this is where Jesus adds hope beyond what all those Old Testament people 
believe. Because they believed in life after the grave, right? Life after the grave. But, but Jesus shows that beyond Sheol, there will be a resurrection. Verse 28 again, where Jesus says, An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Again, he means his own voice. And come out. So Heather asked me, she goes, do you have a spooky sermon for today? Why would I preach a spooky sermon today? Because this is Halloween. Well, my goodness, yes, do I not have a spooky sermon? How do you get spookier than dead people coming out of the tomb? I think that's pretty spooky. And, and that's going to happen someday. That's going to happen on the day that Jesus Christ returns to this earth. By the way, the second coming, judgment day and resurrection day, it, it's all the same day. You talk about a big day that we've got in store somewhere out there in the future. That's going to happen. Dead people are coming out. But the dead will not emerge from their graves and stumble around, you know, like, like walking dead zombies. They will, in fact, be resurrected to life. And every resurrected human being will face one of two destinies. For Christians, Jesus says this in verse 29, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. He is referring to the resurrection of Christians. And Jesus said, they have done good. He does not mean done good in the sense that we Christians must earn our salvation. The Bible is crystal clear that no one is good. No, not one. Not from God's holy vantage point. The entire storyline of the Bible is built on the premise that we lost sinners need what? We need a Savior to save us. From, from eternal death and damnation. So what Jesus means here is that, is that doing good characterizes just the, the life in general of believers. It refers to what we might call the Christian walk, which manifests the life of Christ within us. Arthur Pink says it like this. The Christ-like life within is seen by Christ-like actions without. That's a pretty good description of a Christian right there. You know, when Peter preached about Christ in Acts 10, he said this of Jesus, he went about doing good. That's what Jesus did. He did good stuff. Good flowed out of who he was. Good flowed out of his character. And so here's what Jesus is describing right now. He's describing his followers on that day that he summons them forth from the grave. And he's just describing them in general and says, they have done good. He just means they have manifested my life that I have put within them. That's what they've done. These people will come out of their graves when Jesus returns, and they will come forth to the resurrection of life. Now that forces a question on you and on me. Is Jesus describing me? Is he describing me there? Am I included in those who have done good? Will you, will I, will we be raised to the resurrection of life and in answering that question do not look to your works as the basis for your salvation again we we are saved by grace alone through faith alone we cannot earn eternal life through good works but but do this look at your life look at the general works of your life to see to determine if good works reflect the life of Christ within you Look to make sure that you are bearing what the Bible calls fruit. If, if I told you there was an apple tree right out there and you went out and looked, what would you be looking for? What evidence would you be looking for that, yep, Pastor Todd's telling me the truth. It is indeed an apple tree. What are you looking for? Apples, right? If it's oranges, then I'm an idiot. I need to go back to kindergarten, you know. We're looking for fruit, you know. And so we don't want to be idiots. We, we want to know that, that I'm a Christian and I can get introspective and look at my life. Am I growing Christian fruit, right? We're going to look and make sure that we're not just a nominal Christian. What's a nominal Christian? America's loaded up with nominal Christians. That is a Christian in name only. Talk is cheap, right? Jesus talked about nominal Christians and they're going to see him. So what are we talking about here? The day of his return to planet earth, which is the day of judgment, which is the day of resurrection. And Jesus gave us an interesting little fore, fore glance into that day because there are going to be nominal Christians that day. Because everybody's assembled. Everybody has been called forth. They've been summoned forth. And they appear before the king, Jesus himself. And there's going to be nominal Christians. And, and here's what Jesus says to them in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
will enter the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Wow, a lot of nominal Christians. What a day of shock that will be. Resurrection day, judgment day is the day that all pretenses, all hypocrisy, it will just all be dragged right into the light. Because you might fool people now, not then. Who you really are will be absolutely made manifest on that day. Are you ready? Are you ready for that day? This brings us to the second terrifying group, or the, just the second group, which is the terrifying group. This is the second group of people who will come out of the tombs when Jesus returns. And Jesus said of this second category of people, verse 29, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And so these are the people who Jesus will cast into eternal hell. Now don't take comfort in the done evil comment. You know, as if to say, well, wow, Pastor, I I would never claim to be the holiest person on earth. I mean, you know, I do a little bit, I do this, and I do a little bit of that. But, you know, come on, Pastor, I'm not evil I've never done evil well yes you have and and so have I and I'm talking evil because evil is used from God's holy vantage point from God's perspective the least significant sin that you and I have ever committed is an act of cosmic treason against his divine right to rule us let me give an illustration so my kids my kids were always aware of the general rules of the house you know What's off limits, what they can do, what I expect, you know, and I was not a dad that had a whole bunch of rules because I've always believed if you get a whole bunch, if you give a whole bunch of rules to people, what do, what do people do? Break them. What do sinners do? We sin. I mean, give a kid 10 rules, he'll break all 10. Give him 100, you'll, he's going to break all 100. You're going to be doing nothing as a parent except just disciplining your kid for now, 100 of them, you know. And so I had some pretty general rules and the kids knew what they were. And by and large, it was amazing. They generally upheld all of those rules when I was home. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> when I was home. But, you know, but if I happen to go on an out-of-town trip, I mean, all bets are off. You know, what's the saying? When the cat's away, the mice will play. Absolutely. I would come home, and it was obvious to me almost immediately that my mice had been playing and totally disregarding the rules of the house. Now, let me just say, nothing they did None of the little rule breaking they did was a big deal at all. You know, it's not like they burned the house down. I mean, I came home and found holes in the sheetrock and stuff, the size of the head of one boy and all kinds of stuff like that, you know. <laughs> you know, boys, what happened? And they all, they, all four of them look at it, well, what? How'd that get there? You know, it's like just holes magically appear in the sheetrock at the Ragsdale home. Uh, but it's not like I, any of it was a big deal, but what their infractions represented. Now, that was a bigger deal because their actions signified treason against my right to rule my own home. Whose home is it? Daddy's home. That's my home. That's my stuff. You are my children, right? And so all their little infractions really signified treason. So even the smallest act of defiance was evil in that sense because it revealed their heart attitude, their attitude. How much do you really respect Daddy? How much do you really respect our home? Well, the same is true in the cosmic realm of God's right to rule his universe. Even the smallest act of defiance and rebellion is evil because it reveals what's really in the hearts of us sinners. And so when Jesus refers to those who had done evil, right here in this comment, in our verse, he is referring to all of the unsaved. All of the vast multitude of humanity who refuses to bow the knee to God's right to rule them. All of the ungodly, all of the unsaved dead, all of them are going to hear Christ's voice on that dreadful day. And they will obey it. And they will come forth from their graves. I want to tell you, these are the people. These are the people who refused to listen to Jesus when he spoke the most tender words of grace that you could ever imagine, words of grace that most of us have heard, they refused to listen to that then during their entire lifetime. And I'll tell you right now, Jesus is speaking tender, 
loving, merciful words of grace to sinners. Just telling them, just trust in me, believe in me. I will forgive you. I will make my life complete in you. I will bring you to the Father and he will adopt you. All these wonderful gospel words and these people refuse their whole life to listen. But I want to tell you on that day, on the day that Jesus returns, on the day that he speaks and commands and everybody comes out of the tombs and assembles before him for judgment, on that day, all the unsaved will be forced to hear him. They will be forced to hear his summons. When he commands them to appear before the great white throne of judgment. I tell you again, these are the people who refuse to believe in Christ as the Savior of sinners. But on that day, on that day they will be forced to acknowledge that King Jesus is the Lord. That he is the Lord. In fact, Paul described that great terrifying day of resurrection and judgment when he said in Philippians 2. So imagine that scene. At the name of Jesus. So at this point in time, Jesus has already returned. He has already commanded the dead to appear. They're before the great white throne of judgment. And at the name of Jesus, look what's going to happen. Every knee will bow. I'm talking the most evil, vile, rebellious, repugnant sinners you can imagine. All the way up to the sweetest people that we know and love and work with, went to school with, and our own families. But refused to name the name of Jesus Christ. All, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess what are they going to confess even people that hated jesus jesus christ is lord and just let that grip your mind that means that god has appointed a day in which everyone who has ever lived will be brought right before king jesus and judged it means again it tells us again that death is not the end That means that you and I are going to stand before him. And I just ask you, will your judgment, it will be individualized and personalized to your name, to you. Will your judgment be unto life, as Jesus said, because of your relationship with him? Or or will your judgment be unto condemnation, as Jesus said? And if you are asking yourself that question right now, and if you happen to be concerned about the answer, then I have the privilege of showing you that you can know the answer beyond any doubt, beyond any question. And the answer is our third and final doctrine from our passage where Jesus talked to us about these these very things. And it's this, your existence beyond the grave depends upon your relationship to Jesus Christ. So if you come to the point of standing before God just exactly like you are, and what I mean by that is without ever having benefited from Christ's death on your behalf, without ever having benefited from him giving you his righteousness, him giving you new life in Christ, if those things are true of you, and that's the way you stand on that day, then I'll tell you God will have no no alternative but to banish you from his sight. He cannot stand the stench of a unpurified, unholy, rebellious to the heart, rebellious to the core, sinner. You're sinful if that's you. No matter how good you might seem in your own eyes, and God cannot condone sin. And what's more than that, you will find yourself the object of his intense, fierce wrath. Because you're his creature. He made you. And yet you have rejected his way. You have spurned his son who came to suffer and die for you. But on the other hand, on the other hand, if you will come on that day as just a sinner who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you just believe in what he has done for you, then God promises to receive you just as he receives Jesus. Just as he receives us. Everything that God thinks about Jesus, all the love he has for Jesus, now that Jesus' life has been poured into you, that is exactly how God would receive you. Now, it's been my experience that the the people who have not yet believed in Jesus Christ, they react in one of two ways to the thought of God's judgment. So we're talking about judgment day, right? Some people just simply refuse to believe it. You know, Christians talk about judgment day. Preachers like me preach about judgment day, and they just don't believe it. And they think wrongly that judgment is inconsistent with God's character. God, what's their argument? God is love, right? And so how can a loving God condemn anyone, they say? Well, the answer to that view is that God's love is not inconsistent with his judgment. Without regard to what we might think about it, the Bible just clearly 
openly and obviously speaks of these two things as very, very compatible. The other objection, though, is the one that's more dangerous. These people believe that, that it's somehow ignoble of themselves to receive salvation through Christ. Here's what I mean. To receive salvation in this the way they think, well, that's just to depend on God's grace and mercy. I, I would far rather deal with a just God, a fair God. We hear a lot of that today, but people want God to be fair, and they want him to be equal. I don't want mercy from God, they would say. All I want is a fair shake. I want justice. I will tell you this much. I pity the person who wants nothing from God but justice. The justice of God. The justice of God. The justice of, of, of God will send people to hell. The justice of God will never save anyone because justice condemns. It is only the grace of God in Jesus Christ that pardons and forgives and makes people alive. Most of you know that I have enjoyed through my life listening to R.C. Sproul, uh, reading his books. He's dead now, and so he is in heaven. But he loved to give an illustration about seeking nothing but justice from God. And let me just repeat it. This is, you've heard him preach. you maybe heard this. At the time, years ago, R.C. Sproul was a college professor at a Christian university in New England. And, and he was assigned to teach an Old Testament class to a group of 250 freshmen. And so they arrived that very first day of class. They had to meet in the big chapel because it was such a big class. And R.C. handed out the syllabus, pointed out the dates of the midterm, of the final, as well as the dates that the three papers were required. The first one was due on September 30th. The second one was due on October 30th. And the third one on November 30th. And they were due by noon on his desk, on his desk unless the student had a legitimate death in their family or a medical situation. So he gave them the rules. September 30th came, and 225 students came in with their term papers. 25 were trembling in their boots. Oh, Professor Sproul, we didn't get our papers done. Please, please don't give us an F for this assignment. Won't you give us a couple of more days to finish this? We just haven't yet made the adjustment from high school to college. We promise it'll never happen again. And he said, okay. Okay, you can have two days more to complete your paper. Now, don't let it happen again. Oh, we won't. We promise we won't. October 30th came. This time, 200 students came with their papers. And 50 did it. And he said to the 50s, where's your papers? Oh, professor, I, we, we had all these midterm exams. And it was homecoming weekend. We didn't prepare properly. I mean, we didn't budget our time very well. Please don't fail us for this. Just give us one more chance. And he said, all right. But, but this is the last time, he said. And, and he says that they just literally spontaneously broke into applause, began to sing a song for him. He goes, I was the most popular professor on campus all the way until November 30th. When... 150 students came with their term paper, and 100 didn't. And he looked at the 100 and said, where's your term papers? Hey, prof, don't worry about it. You know, we'll have it for you in a couple of days. And he said to one man in particular, his name is Johnson, Johnson, where's your paper? I don't have it yet, but I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you here in a couple of days. And R.C. took out what is really all students' worst nightmare. That's the little, little black grade book and he says okay let's, Johnson so Johnson you don't have your paper no sir I don't okay fine F Harrison uh, where's your paper I don't have it sir F now with one voice there was just a ringing protest from everybody just echoed all the way through the chapel and and guess what they said that's not fair what did you say R.C. Sproul asked. And they, they all said, that's not fair. And R.C. said, Johnson, just looking at him, did, did you just say, that's not fair? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, Mr. Johnson. So it's justice that you want. Yes, Johnson said. Well, okay, it, it seems to me that I remember you were late the last time, weren't you? Yes, I was. And R.C. said, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to erase last month's grade, and I'll give you an F for that one, too. 
God forbid that I should not be just and fair. And, and then R.C. said, now, who else wants justice? And there wasn't a mumbling word among the 100. Now that, church, is what happens when the judge of all the earth does right, does what's fair, does what we deserve, does what is just, when he acts justly. All men and women are condemned by God's justice because his justice sends men and women to hell. I just ask you as we close, do you, do you really want justice? Do you really want God to act fairly with you? Do you really want God to give you what you deserve, what you have earned through your whole miserable little life? How foolish of any of us for wanting justice. On the other hand, how wonderful that the man or woman who has been given new life in Jesus Christ never has to confront that justice. Instead, they will enter by the portal of physical death because we all die, resurrection because we will all be raised, and they will do all of that and enter into the fullness of life, eternal life, all through what? Through justice, my goodness, no, but through grace, through the unearned favor of God. Do you trust the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation? You've got to decide this because the decisions that you are making in your life right now, they affect your eternity. Death is not the end of your existence. There are two forms of existence beyond the grave as we have seen. One of them is, I mean, tremendously good and one of them is horrifically terrible. And the particular kind of existence that you will have in eternity depends exclusively upon your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so please... Right, close our eyes and stand to our feet and pray. Please examine yourself in regard to your relationship to Jesus Christ. Would you please stand to your feet? God, the Lord Jesus Christ, as you know, in this passage, just he just took us all the way to the very end. The second coming, resurrection day, judgment day. All of us will be there, God. Every man, woman, boy and girl and Lord we we don't want to leave this worship service if it was my will it, there would not be one person who leaves unsaved unsecured not one that leaves without this sure promise and assurance that they have received life from you right now and they are ready for that none of us really wants to die I know that probably most of our Christians that, that most of us that are Christians if I asked we're not we're not really afraid to die because we know what awaits us. Now, we are scared to death of the manner of our death, but that be that what it may, we're ready, God. And yet, Lord, if there are any here who aren't, we pray that you will move powerfully in them. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.